what are the best things to do if they have advanced liver disease? Because if you had the ability to handle the worst case scenario, then you'd be in pretty good shape. Because most people don't have the end stage liver disease. They have some type of um, stage that's before that. As you may already know, uh, the liver goes through stages. Uh, it may start off in an inflamed state and then go into the fatty stage and then cirrhotic stage, which is scar tissue. Or you can start with a fatty liver, which then produces more inflammation and then turns into cirrhosis. Now, typically, on average, it takes like 10 years to go from a fatty liver all the way into cirrhosis, right? And during that process, many times it's silent. You just one day end up with this serious problem that gave you no clues. Now, you may have some you know, fatigue, weakness, things like that, but you may not identify or connect the dots. And I'm including in that category all the people with a fatty liver. I mean, just think about if you take a look at your, your toes right now and you're standing up and you can't see your toes because your belly is in the way, we know your liver is fatty because the fat around the organs in the abdominal area is a spill off from the liver being too fatty. I mean, just think about how many people actually have belly fat. I mean, it's very, very high. So this video definitely includes anyone with belly fat as well. Here's the thing. Um, the liver is very robust. It's one of the only organs that can completely regenerate, uh, but it does take time. It could take three years or longer. If you have too much scar tissue in the liver because you have cirrhosis, there is a point of no return. You have to get on the waiting list for a new liver. And unfortunately, it's a very long list. That being said, there's not a lot of studies in this area. I want to talk about what I would do if I had advanced cirrhosis of the liver and I was on the transplant list. What would I do? Okay, that's what I'm going to talk about because that's like the worst case scenario. You know, the doctor says it's permanent. There's no chance of reversing this. Well, let's talk about it because there's actually six things that I want to discuss. The first thing that I would do is get my body into um, a state of autophagy. What is autophagy? It's the condition where your body is recycling um, damaged proteins in the cells. So it's a bit of recycling things you don't need or damaged parts of your body, including the liver, and then making new proteins as well. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more that autophagy does for your body. Like, for example, cancer originates in the mitochondria. You also have all the scar tissue or fibrosis in the liver where autophagy can help clean some of that up. Autophagy also can help get rid of intracellular pathogens like viruses and bacteria and yeast. So it can clean those up as well. I mean, you've heard of the condition hepatitis, right? Well, that involves uh, a virus. So again, autophagy is very, very important in helping your liver. All right, so what can trigger autophagy? The biggest thing is fasting, okay? Regular intermittent fasting, where you're fasting on a daily basis, you're going for like 18 hours and you're eating within a six hour window. And then especially periodic prolonged fasting. So once a week, you fast for 48 hours. Once a month, maybe you fast for a week. Why is that so important? Because you can really create a significant dent into this problem by doing prolonged fasting if you have cirrhosis and scar tissue. And apparently you can even get autophagy while you're fasting within four hours because the liver is used to this action of replacing a lot of cells on a regular basis. So we have fasting, okay, intermittent and prolonged. We also have exercise. Exercise can stimulate autophagy, right? You have sleep can activate autophagy. Ketones can activate autophagy, right? That's getting on a low carb diet. That's eliminating snacking. And then we also have other types of therapy like cold therapy, taking a cold shower, a sauna or infrared therapy. Coffee has a certain polyphenol that can help with autophagy. Of course, it's not going to be significant. It's not going to compare to autophagy. So just by drinking a pot of coffee a day is not going to help you. Also, extra virgin olive oil can help to a certain degree with autophagy and also consuming more cruciferous vegetables. All right, number two, which is actually part of one, but it's specifically fasting, okay? Fasting helps with autophagy, but it does other things for your liver that I'm going to discuss. Number one, it actually significantly lowers inflammation. If you can get rid of the inflammation, you could definitely stop this whole process from getting worse. 
Fasting also significantly increases your antioxidant networks without actually taking antioxidants. And the other cool thing that fasting will do, it will decrease liver enzymes. Now let's talk about number three, Tudka. Tudka, what is Tudka? Tudka is a type of bile salt. It's also been used in Chinese medicine for over 3,000 years, so it's been around for a very long time. But if you actually do research on Tudka in relationship to liver function, uh, you'll be blown away. First of all, it helps thin the bile because one of the underlying causes of a liver problem is there's some type of blockage within the bile ducts. And the bile can actually act as a detergent and irritate and even scar the liver. Tutka also directly decreases fibrosis. Tutka directly rehabs the hepatocyte, the liver cell. Tutka also protects the liver cell against certain things like oxidation. And when you take Tutka, I'm not going to get into necessarily brands, but you want to take two on an empty stomach in the morning and two in the afternoon on an empty stomach. Because if you take it with food, it tends to act on the food as a bile salt and not on your liver. Okay, what's the next thing? Well, you want to induce or trigger phase one, phase two detoxification. This phenomena or enzyme process occurs in your liver where you're turning poisons into harmless particles, okay? So it's converting these fat-soluble chemicals into harmless water-soluble chemicals that get uh, released through the bile ducts in other ways. And so when the liver gets damaged, you, you don't have this process working at full throttle, and that can back things up, especially poison, since the liver is constantly breaking down poisons and protecting you, like in sulfur-rich vegetables, like in cruciferous, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, arugula, radish, things like that. Green tea is another trigger for phase one, phase two detoxification. And straight sulforaphane, which is the phytonutrient in broccoli sprouts. So if you add broccoli sprouts to your salad, you can greatly help your liver. And the next one on the list is milk thistle. So as you can see, we're really hitting this problem over the head with a sledgehammer because these are all the most potent things to help your liver. Okay, milk thistle is a very interesting herb. It's this weed that you can consume the seeds. In fact, a lot of people, you have it in their backyard. So you can grab some and grind the seeds and, and put it on your salad. And it protects the liver against poisons, uh, even poisonous snakes, even poisonous mushrooms. In fact, if you're also on medication on a regular basis, or you know someone who's on medication, have them start taking milk thistle just to reduce some of the side effects. But it basically gives you properties to protect the liver. It also prevents fibrosis. It decreases inflammation. It helps neutralize toxins. It helps decrease liver enzymes. And it regenerates hepatocytes, liver cells. So as you can see, it does a lot. It can also help protect the liver against medication, too much caffeine, uh, alcohol, Tylenol, lots of medications. And the last thing is tocotrienols. Now, what is tocotrienols? It's a type of vitamin E. Anytime you have scar tissue or fibrosis, vitamin E, especially tocotrienols, is a great thing to help break up scar tissue. So that's why I included it on the list. Also, it's a very powerful antioxidant to protect against free radical damage, inflammation, and the things that lead to fibrosis. So the two things that tocotrienols will do is decrease inflammation and decrease the risk of fibrosis. And if you're going to get tocotrienol, I would make sure you get it um, as a standalone um, complex, not added with the tocopherols because they tend to compete. High iron in your blood can create inflammation and cirrhosis. You also have a situation where you have uh, blockage in your bile ducts, which can back up into the liver and create a lot of liver problems, including gallstones and many other issues, as well as your own immune system, where you have liver antibodies that are attacking your own liver. And I put that video up right here. Check it out.